And so you've got to start looking at it in a different way in order to drive costs out to deliver better service, to meet some of those performance metrics, and also to simply take spend out of your operational model. Clock in, scrub up, and join us behind the red line. You're listening to First Case, a perioperative podcast bringing you exciting interviews, engaging discussions, and innovative solutions that are changing the way patients receive surgical care. Each episode, we talk to frontline staff, perioperative leadership, and nursing entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the back table to the boardroom, from wheels in to wheels out, we tackle the real-life issues affecting the OR. Whether you're tuning in for surgical service education or in inspiration. We're glad you're here. And now it's time to roll back and start the first case. On this center spotlight, we speak with Dan Fister, president and consultant at United Pathways. And Dan has been a guest on the podcast previously. We'll talk about that a little bit. And we're going to have a treat for you because we are actually doing this podcast on Two different ones. I have Melanie Perry joining me from First Case. I am also the co-host of the First Case podcast with Melanie, but also the Power Supply podcast. And so, Melanie, we're going to play a little tandem conversation here. I'm going to cover a lot of the supply chain type oriented questions, and you're going to be asking a lot of the clinical operating room type questions. And we're going to be role modeling while we talk to Dan this collaboration that can happen between supply chain and the operating room. And Dan's going to tell us how today. I'm excited to hear him talk. I enjoyed it when he was on the First Case podcast before and the conversation we had then, but he's a wealth of knowledge. He has a lot of good information to share. Being able to talk about the ways we can build our relationships between our two departments and break down some silos is always a good conversation to have. Yeah. And Dan has really seen this industry change over time, and he's going to give us a historical perspective that help lends to his vision and what he's seeing today and what he thinks is coming for the future. So we're going to be right back with Dan Fister after a short break. A 17 Studios production. You're listening to First Case. Joining us now is Dan Fister, president and consultant at United Pathways. And Dan, love having you on the show. And we're actually going to be having this conversation go out on First Case as well as Power Supply. And you've been a guest on both of those podcasts talking about some pretty important topics. On Power Supply, we discuss change management, especially as it relates to healthcare supply chain. And then on First Case, we talked about preference cards and really this concept of immersing supply chain professionals and experts in the OR to bring that expertise and help streamline and smooth the process and how to do so effectively. And so today, we're really excited to have you back on because we're going to have a little bit more of a looser conversation and one that relates to what you're doing on a day-to-day basis uh, across the country with various healthcare organizations. Well, thank, thanks for the opportunity. And, uh, and as you said, we've done this a couple of times, so I hope I haven't overstayed my welcome. <laughs> never, never. I sort of have an agenda today. I mean, a part of it is I, I you know, as a, a vendor, I want to introduce myself to your listeners, but I don't want to take a lot of time doing that. So, yeah, you know, I am going to give a bit of a commercial for, you know, a few minutes, but then, then I really want to get into some of the trends and some of the things that I've been bumping into in the industry and, and some things I'd like to talk about. So if it's okay, I'm just maybe just going to, you know, take the wheel for a second and just give a little bit of background information on who I am and where I came from and how I got here. By all means, Dan. And I know we talked about it a little bit, but you're really going to be giving us a little bit more specifics than you have on some of your introductions in the other podcasts. So take it away. Okay. Well, and cut me off if, uh, you know, if it just gets too boring. But I always introduce myself as I'm an old hospital guy, emphasis on old. I started working in hospitals when I was young with entry-level jobs. I was always trying to move up, and over many years, I 
I worked in most clinical support roles that they were in the hospital and housekeeping and distribution. I was an EMT orderly in an emergency room for, for many years, and that was super educational. And that's probably where the road turned for me a little bit, where I started to see the difference between a job and a vocation in healthcare, all the illness and trauma that came in the front door, all the incredible people who just struggled through all of that. I saw babies being born in trucks, shark attacks, third degree burns, way too many cardiac arrests. It was definitely a defining moment for me and showed me what a different place a hospital is. I was also a pharmacy IV technician for a while. I was terrible at it. <laughs> I, I literally had to quit before I did something <laughs> wrong. Then I got into supply chain and I was in case card and sterile supply and surgical materials management. Eventually, I got noticed by a major multinational healthcare product and services company. I joined their consulting team, and I used all that previous hospital experience in their sales support and also process improvement projects for the customer. And then in 2014, I decided to jump off the cliff and start my own company, and I launched United Pathways, which I always describe as a microscopic consulting company offering various process solutions for hospitals. Why did you come up with the name? I, I'm so curious on the name, and I have some hunches but I'd really like to hear it from you, like how you landed on that. So, so my tagline is, is that there are three major pathways within the hospital system. There's the clinical pathway, the information pathway, and the logistics pathway, or the movement of people, the movement of things, and the movement of information. And my thesis statement is, is that whenever there is a gap between the pathways, there's a problem. And I maintain that all the problems in healthcare are in the gaps between these pathways. So Dan, I got to jump on that because, you know, it, it's like one of the reasons why we're having this conversation on two different podcast brands, both Power Supply and First Case, is for exactly that reason to, you know, bring those pathways together and have some shared insights and the overlap in those responsibilities. And it, it really aligns well with the vision you know, that we've had with, with how we wanted to approach this. And you're going to be the first to really have come on and done an interview that's going out for both brands like that. So I just want to, I, I, we picked the right person, I guess, is what I'm saying. Well, I appreciate that. And I guess I would say, you know, with that, with that background and that perspective, what I've tried to do on the various projects that I've gotten within hospitals is even though I may be hired for a very specific thing, I, I've tried to look at the interlocking connections that they have with the other pathways. And then, like I said, the reason why I came up with the name United Pathways, I, I know it sounds like an airline, but the idea is that to unite the different pathways and to, to uncover those gaps in between the workflows. So a lot of the stuff I've done over the last few years, there's been projects to design material flows for new construction. I've done entire hospitals, bed towers, or just department expansions. I've done projects that are based on just PAR analytics, supply room remodels, team development, change management, workflow redesign, business process support for ERP conversions, interim management. So it's been a mixed bag of customer challenges, but I've always tried to look at, all, at every one of those things holistically again, in the movement of people and things and information. I would say that I, I've been lucky, I think, to, be, to have a wide variety of projects. I think I've done good work for my customers, but I know for sure that I've really benefited from learning new things and developing solutions that might be just outside of the box. So Dan, one of the things that I noticed you started doing on LinkedIn was you began posting a supply chain update from your page on Wednesdays. And very recently, you provided a really cool overview of the changing reimbursement model over the years. And I thought maybe you could just tell us, maybe summarize some of that and really how you've had to adapt the way that you're supporting your clients or customers as a result of those changes. Yeah. And actually, thanks for that. That actually opens me up into what I really wanted to talk about today, because you know, again, like I said, my commercial is going to be short, but I, I want to talk about what I think I'm seeing in the industry. But in order to do that, we do have to go back a little bit. 
So the listeners who are my age will remember when hospitals could charge for everything and get paid for everything. People might remember the charge stickers placed on every single item in the entire building. And this was back when supply chain was called central distribution or central supply, and they did everything. So they did receiving, stocking, sterile supply, case cart, laundry, and charge capture. I still remember sitting in a dark warehouse, pulling zillions of charge stickers on four by four packs and wanting to just (laughs) shoot myself. I also had to key in, (laughs) I also had to key in the seven digit charge codes for the floors. So moving forward in the eighties, Medicare developed the models to control costs and drive competition. These were the capitated rates, the bundled payments, the DRGs. And this created a perspective of a total event from admission to discharge versus the individual item repayments. So what that meant was, is that things that were common to the care event, urinals, bedpans, gloves, gowns, preps, four by fours, all that kind of stuff, commodity products, packs, became non-reimbursable. Things that were unique to the patient, patient-sized implants, specialty items, carve-outs would be covered. You could make money on those things. And this continues to develop today. And and the current MIP system or the merit-based incentive program is based on performance. And within that program, 30% of the weight is focused on quality, 25% for promoting IT system integration, 15% for improving activities, and 30% for cost measures. So the industry is really going to performance-based medicine. And that's a whole like deeper conversation about wellness and approved therapies. And I'm not a clinician, and, and that's a very complex therapy model. But from my logistics perspective, that business model is pushing workflows towards horizontal integrations, okay? So, so from silos, verticals to horizontals, the problem is, Health systems are built in verticals and not horizontals. So the secondary challenge that I see is defining the value of converting a patient workflow into a horizontal pathway versus the current state handoffs between departments and responsibilities. So that's kind of wordy, but what, I, what I'm seeing more and more on both the provider and the supplier sides is the need to develop a strategic perspective versus transactional, okay, because of the way reimbursement is driving everybody towards this horizontal perspective. But again, how do you do that if you're in a vertical? And, and historically, if it's in your DNA to just be a vertical. Dan, real quick, what does that look like? for clinicians like Melanie in the OR? Like how, how would they recognize that verticality? And, you know, can you paint a picture of what it might look like for them horizontally? So, yes, though we're going to go far and fast. So I would say that the first part's real easy. And Melanie, stop me if I'm wrong, because again, <laughs> I, I'm, not a, I'm not a nurse, right? And I'll say that, you know, obviously I'm not. So a nurse in an operating room is real clear on the vertical. And it's because she's behind the red line. And if you, you can't walk behind the red line unless you have permission and you have to completely change your clothes and you better have a good business being behind the red line because you're not welcome. Okay. And all the activities that go on behind the red line are very clearly defined. And depending on the health system, I mean, a lot of things are shifting out there, but depending on the health system, like supply chain might stop at the red line. They might just drop the product off and then somebody behind the red line catches it, puts it away and organizes it and then assembles it for the case cart and pushes it to the nurse. Now, just like a case cart is a good example, there may be three different roles and responsibilities in assembling a case cart. And you may have a supply chain person doing a commodity pick. You might have a sterile processing person adding the instrumentation to it. You have a center core nurse or the the RN that's going to be in the room or the surgical tech that's doing the top off. And then all of those supplies may come from different locations that are managed by different people. So the, the case pick room may be managed by materials management or it may be managed by sterile supply. 
the instrumentation may be down in SPD, or it might be kept only in the center core and picked by nurses, or it might be picked by a surgical tech. And then the top off, the, you know, the whole identification of the top off, what the RN picks or doesn't pick is governed by the preference card, which is owned by nurses, and they never get around to actually fixing it. And the pick list has to be managed by three different organizations, and the pick list is always wrong. So all of those verticals represent, like, number one, they all have to come together to just simply create a case card. You know, so, so think about it like a meal in a restaurant. If you've got one guy who's only in charge of the mashed potatoes and one guy who's only in charge of the peas, you know, I mean, all of that has to come together to get all the food on the plate. And then it gets delivered to the customer, right? To, to the room, to the surgeon, to the patient. It, it works. I mean, don't get me wrong. It works. I mean, and I used to, you know, have various jobs and all of those roles that I've just talked about. It does work. Everybody gets it done. But it's not clean. It's not streamlined. It's not efficient. And there's all types of problems that, that come out of that. So to your second point, it's okay, what would a horizontal look like? A horizontal would look like where that same process still happens, but ownership is seamless throughout the entire process. And we could talk about like who should do all of that. And I definitely have opinions around it. But the point would be is that there wouldn't be that many handoffs and gaps. Like let's just say something simple between the guy who picks the commodity products and then pushes the cart over to sterile processing where they add the trays. Like, well, like why just that? Why do you need two different people doing that? Like, like why? Now you can, I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with it, but does it deliver the best product? And the reason why that gets done is because of a whole bunch of other downstream products, which are like the trays aren't done yet when the commodity products are being picked for the case cart. They're still being processed. They're still being used. They won't get done until one o'clock in the morning, right? And is that the best way to do instrumentation management? Well, maybe it is because you can't have a whole bunch of trays because capital money is, is not abundant and all types of other reasons. But the point is with all of this is that it all has to come together to deliver a patient care service. And you have to start looking at it horizontally because that's how you're being paid. And so you've got to start looking at it in a different way in order to drive costs out to deliver better service to meet some of those performance metrics and also to simply take spend out of your operational model. So can I ask you a question about KPIs in that scenario? Because key performance indicators exist, whether you're in supply chain or you're a clinician. Does this horizontal integration change your KPIs? And I don't mean adjust the ones you already have. I mean, does it bring new KPIs to the table to, to measure how well you're doing in this horizontal model? So, I mean, yes and no. I, I mean, uh, the, the KPIs are being decided by the industry and by the government. You know, so again, if if it's like quality IT system integration, improvement activities and, and saving money, cost cost containment, so you already got KPIs that are coming from on high and are pushing its way down into the industry. So then what that means is, is, is how do you then develop the clinical supply chains that guarantee quality communication, continuous improvement, and lowest price, right? Because that, that is coming down. So the problem is, is that if the KPIs are, are clear, the structures, though, are not really integrated and the cost to build the team tools and technology don't deliver the standard return on investment that the CFO will expect. So, so again, this is another challenge in the industry. You're going to be judged on performance. So that means quality products, streamlined workflows, efficiencies, no stockouts, high-touch customer service, demand planning, advanced analytics, staff training, empowerment. But who pays for all that? Okay, what business unit owns the end to end throughput and how do you justify it? Okay, so 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 much is intangible. You know, think about like our standard sales messaging that we're used to in the industry. You can buy a thing 
a product that says it reduces length of stay, or you could do a project to review wait times in the ER. The industry approach right now is always use case oriented. Okay. The, the director of surgery gets budget dollars to solve a particular use case, but the upstream and downstream effects, the roles and responsibilities are outside of the use case. So what I'm saying is how it looks to me from the small, you know, little spot that I sit in is, is I think the industry is shifting. It's really going to a good place. I think this horizontal view, an event-based patient model with high performance expectations is really good. But we don't know how to get there because the usual way of looking at things doesn't work. Okay. And again, I, I'm a microscopic consulting house. I, I don't have a big building with my name on it. I, I'd really like one, but I'm I'm probably never gonna get there. But what I'm seeing is that the customer need for change management, for workflow integration across the silos, for breaking down cultural barriers and and perhaps most importantly, installing a sense of vision and mission in workers that are already really burned out from high expectations of performance. You know, and, and I would also say, just real quick, that this is also true on the supplier side as well. So the annual demand for more service and reduced prices from the customer, while being pushed internally to deliver on ever-increasing sales plans for their shareholders in Wall Street. You know, and, and so like, how do you, how do you, how do you thread that needle? And for a lot of years, we always heard the buzzword of changing the paradigm, right? We got to change the paradigm. And that's kind of a worn out phrase now, but the models have to transform and it's not going to be easy. So I want to interrupt you real quick and go back to the comment you made about breaking down silos, because you're talking about the vertical versus horizontal workflows and horizontal makes sense when we're all siloed and all of this. but I guess listening to you talk about a horizontal workflow and how that would be better, it seems like then one department needs to be and ultimately have responsibility for everything, right? And so that it comes down to it and they are the ones in charge of, I don't even really know what I'm asking. My brain can understand this, but I don't know that I can get it out. But it seems like one person with or one department within the hospital is in charge of pushing it all out from start to finish so that we have a horizontal workflow. Is that right? Yeah. And, and again, I would say like, it's not going to be everything, right? Like you can't have one department that's completely in charge of everything from diagnosis to therapy to, you know, all right. of that. H however, uh, I, I, I maintain that the supply chain organization is the silo most capable of being this industry change agent because it already acts horizontally with every department inside the hospital mm -hmm. and every supplier that services the hospital. Okay. Yeah, they, they touch, they touch everybody. They touch everybody. Seems. Yeah. But, but traditionally supply chain has been tasked with one thing and that's driving costs out. Okay. Making sure the products on the shelf and then saving money. And so, and especially again, to go back to what happened with Medicare and the DRGs and bundled payments, they, they became laser focused on taking spend, uh, reducing costs, taking spend out of, out of the, the mix. So, so they're really good at negotiations, at contracts. And traditionally, they've also always been yelled at for the empty shelves, right? So supply chain, in my opinion, needs to become the department of transformation, the, the engine underneath the patient event and, and not to be disrespectful to the continuous improvement teams or lean six sigma groups and black belts but supply chain is in the weeds the clinical and supply chain are joined at the hip you can't take care of a patient without a thing and supply chain provides all the things but they've been the people that have been in the back of house in the basement and and again especially when they lost revenue when they when they stopped being a revenue producing department then they became the cost of doing business, okay? So I think supply chain has to raise its game. They have to offer more. They have to do more, support more. But who's going to make that investment? Okay, so I'm going to come back to the ROI. So we've all been doing this a long time. And the reality is process improvement costs money. And it won't bring the CFO the three to one higher dollar savings that he wants. You talk about that, but I'm concerned about the technology 
especially that's required. Like, and it goes back to what you said about burnout and the workforce shortage. Like, I also just don't think we're going to be able to throw bodies at it. It's been a constant conversation on many of our podcasts. And so, you know, you're going to have to likely invest in technology. And, and that is going to be, in many cases, a costly upfront investment. And, and and maybe there'll be different ways that suppliers bring their tech to market and there'll be different strategies that way. But in the end, that's been my biggest concern is you know, we have a lot of people doing some mundane tasks that don't necessarily need to be done by a human, but because we're also vertically integrated in the way that suppliers sell their products into hospitals and they don't talk to each other in sort of automated ways. And and I've mentioned before on a couple of other shows, I really feel like an open API should become an IT contracting requirement for that reason. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to pay for you have to pay for this technology to help us get there. Or are you saying it's independent of technology because it's about mission and vision and, you know, the way that the culture changes that fosters this? So I'm going to say I think it's somewhere in the middle and shared because the other danger of technology is that, you know, we think it's going to solve everything. You know, you know blockchain now is going to solve everything. And that's not to say that technology won't bring enormous value into the supply chain. I mean, if you think about what we all just learned in the pandemic is that part of the problem was is that frontline customers didn't have visibility into their tier two, tier three, and tier four supply chain partners. So they might be able to see what their their major prime vendor dis- distributor has in terms of the masks and Q-tips and gloves, but they couldn't see past that. And then, and then all the, the upstream manufacturers and suppliers, it's not like they're opening up their books and they're sharing their inventory levels or the raw material levels or all of that. So definitely as technology gets to the next levels, the next generation supply chains, where everybody has visibility up and downstream, and then you can make choices and decisions and you know what's coming in and you can react and you can align your supply chains to all of that, Sure. But I still maintain that that what actually drives all of it, all the way back to raw material in some mine somewhere in China, is what is happening with a nurse and a patient in a room. And if you think about one of the differences of healthcare versus any other industry that has a supply chain is variability at the point of care. So going back all the way back to like a surgery. So a surgery is a is an event that is designed, right? So something happens to us, we go see our doctor, we get diagnosed, a therapy is decided, a procedure is scheduled, a preference card is selected, supplies are assembled, everything gets pushed into the room, then the doctor opens up the patient, something's different, and all of a sudden you have to bring in more supplies, different trays, you know, in some cases you've got to flip the patient completely upside down. I mean, all types of things happen that are unexpected. Okay. Now the hospital is really good at unexpected. Like that's, that's where, that's where it's magic is. You know, they are really good at reacting and adjusting and, and bringing in whatever is needed to complete the event. But how do you run a supply chain like that? How do you run a supply chain that, that has so much variability at the demand signal? And that's where I maintain that, yes, the technology will have a play, I, I still think, though, that that the step one, before we get to next generation science fiction technology that's, you know, drone deliveries and, and all of that, that I think step one is understanding what's happening at the point of care and at the point of the demand. And the best people to understand that is a relationship between supply chain and clinicians. And what that means is, is again, Supply chain needs to step up and not just be box movers. And clinicians need to recognize that there is a certain pattern to what they do that has to be understood. And they have to share in the development of the new model, the new work stream model that delivers what is needed. And so that people aren't just reacting to what is happening. And then that ripple effect just 
cascades backwards and everybody gets crazy. And all we're ever doing is reacting, reacting, reacting. And especially, uh, it's like, again, just to roll it back to the financial model, if you're not getting paid for most of the commodity products that are used in the hospital, but at the same time, again, what we learned in the pandemic is you can't maybe do just in time anymore and you can't really lean out your supply chain to the levels that we were doing for a long time. Now, resiliency is another big thing we're all looking at in the industry. So then, then how do you do it? You know, how do you, how do you thread that needle? How do you balance that out? I, I can't run out of anything, but at the same time, if I have too much, my cost of capital is, is ballooning. I'm going to have expiry problems. I'm going to have all types of other issues. And so the, the way you have to manage all of that is you've got to get closer to the patient event. You have to study it. You have to learn from it. You have to work with the clinicians and you have to design new models that communicate what's happening so that when you drop a technology in later on, the information coming out is good. The technology is simply reactive to the event. It's not going to design the event. So you still have to figure out what's happening to inform the technology so that then you can improve and even get better in your pathways. So do you think that it would be beneficial to supply chain if nurses worked in supply chain as well to provide that clinical insight? Yeah, and they do. There's a, Many health systems have that. But again, I, I would suggest that how they're being utilized needs to go up a notch because most nurses that work with supply chain are, doing for, are working in value analysis, right? Now, there is a huge movement in supply chain organizations and a lot of the, 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 the very good, the very mature big box health systems where medical directors are now also engaged in supply chain. And I've seen some systems that were just state of the art on this. Give a little shout out to the Cleveland Clinic that I spent a little time at. This is definitely, you know, the medical directors are becoming very much engaged in this process. But again, they need, they need like the subject matter experts to help inform them so that they can develop that clinical supply chain. Because a, a doctor isn't going to go stock product on a shelf, right? And he's not going to know what that means. And he's not going to know necessarily the effect of a stock out or when you've got the three ORIFs and you only have two trays, you know, and things like that. So again, again, the, the subject matter experts at the worker level need to need to realize that they're not just there to just get through the day, but that knowledge that they have from working that space every day, reacting to the demand patterns, that needs to be coalesced and brought up to decision makers to help inform the new model. Yeah, I think pouring their expertise into creating something proactive instead of constantly living in that state of reaction um, would be an improvement for all of us, for sure. Yeah. And, and again, I would say that, like, you know, the, the strength of supply chain is those are the people that get it done. OK, and that's the strength of nursing, too. You know, I mean, I, I always say, like, you know, every nurse has a pair, uh, you know, a pair of bandage scissors and paper tape in their pocket. And like when the zombie apocalypse comes, like, you know, that's who I want by my side as a, you know, a nurse and a supply chain guy. But I think the solutions are going to roll up to sleeves, get in the weeds, move across the silos, relationship build, problem solve and understand the up and downstream effects. And it's going to be the people that are in the weeds, the people that are at that level that are going to be able, to, like I said, to inform leadership, to inform the strategy designers about how to build the new model. All right, Dan, you know, you've really got me thinking about some things right now because I see a strategic role and a certain kind of personality type that has to facilitate that. And, you know, you I've read some books and they've described you know, different organizational positions like visionary who really leads the mission, but an integrator who makes sure that that vision is implemented, but also implemented in a way that can actually be accomplished instead of chasing every new great idea. And there's lots of great ideas coming from visionaries. It just makes me think that that integrator piece is the type of personality that's required to cross over those silos and get into the weeds. Have you heard about any of those kinds of concepts and, and the right personality type for somebody that would facilitate this transition as you're talking about? 
Yeah, I, I'm actually seeing, there's a certain buzzword that I'm seeing in the industry a lot more. But before I get to that, I'll say, uh, can you imagine if uh, your title was visionary and you had that on your business card? Yeah. That'd be great. I'd love to hand that out. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give that but, to Hank Balch. I'm going to have him put that on his card. It is, yeah, on, that, but that, by the way, Integrator yeah, is definitely. on my LinkedIn. And okay. for that reason, absolutely. Less than 2% of the population fits that mold. So it's just kind of an interesting fun I, fact. I, I would definitely, I mean, I, I'm aligned with what you're saying. And, and again, what, what I'm seeing in the industry is the term solution architect is being bandied around a lot more within healthcare. And it's a term that was lifted from the IT world, right? You know, an IT programmer is what he does. He architects a technology solution. But I think that that is appropriate for healthcare because it, everything that I've been talking about, about how to integrate across the pathways, across the gaps, how to go from verticals to horizontals, you'd need somebody that can literally architect that out. And, and what they have to do is they have to have the ability to go horizontally across the organization. And a lot of times that means you're stepping into areas that you don't have the subject matter expertise in there. So some of the skill sets that you need is the classic, you know, listening, asking open-ended questions, you know, empathy, you know, emotional intelligence, all of that stuff. And, and treading lightly because you are going into people's verticals. And their entire DNA has been a vertical. And now all of a sudden, maybe you're, you know, you've been, you've been charged with architecting some new solution and it's going to be disruptive. So all of that won't be glamorous. You know, again, it's the roll up the sleeves work. And again, I feel that supply chain has always been the, de the department that gets things done. The challenge for leadership is that they will have to make that investment and be a sponsor for that transformation. Because the new business relationships, the savings, the efficiencies, and delivering better patient care will come from improving the operational models. Everything is dependent on the movement of people, things, and information. If these pathways can be deeply understood and integrated, hospitals, vendors, patients, and suppliers will all benefit. So again, I think a new model is where we're going. It's where the industry is pushing us. We're going to get there one way or another. You're either going to get there kicking and screaming <laughs> or you're or you're going to blaze the road yourself. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. I, I, you know, I get to see the efforts that health systems are making. And I think big picture where it's going is. Good. Yeah, uh, you've been a fantastic guest on the podcast previously and really a wealth of knowledge. And I think it's just that experience. Sometimes when you just watch healthcare transform, there are patterns that emerge out of that, right, Dan? There are patterns that are consistent regardless of how things change. And I think it gives you really incredible perspective and the ability to put things into perspective as you see that big picture. Again, this is another one that's been very educational, but I also know you like educating the industry. So I'm using that to kind of tease you know, some value that you're going to be bringing forward if you want to talk about that and also tell everybody how they can reach out to you if they want to network and learn more and follow you on LinkedIn and get your insights on Wednesdays. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I am working on an educational module that I will be launching soon, hopefully. It's turning out to be a little bit more work than I thought it would be. But, but over the years and the various roles that I had, I, I often got asked to to really explain like how a hospital works, all the parts and pieces, the roles and responsibilities. And I ended up just creating a body of work that I called Hospital 101. And I realized then that there was some value in it. And so I'm putting all that together and that will be available for people to purchase. And, and it, it would be, could be good for salespeople, for departments that want to learn about other departments down the hallway that they don't know what they do. I'll talk about a lot of the things we talked about today, about how hospitals get paid, how the supply chains work, what nurses do, what a case card is, and things like that. So that'll, that'll be coming soon. And then to, to get in touch with me, again, I think most people now, LinkedIn is probably the best way, I think, for business people. And again, it's Dan Fister on LinkedIn. And I think that's probably the most efficient way that people can find me. Excellent. I'm going to spell your last name. So when they search, they know to P-F-I-S-T-E-R is Dan's last name. Dan, rock star job today. Really, really appreciate your insights and enjoyed the interview. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. I appreciate the time. Hey! 
All right, that was Dan Fister, president and consultant at United Pathways. And Melanie, great conversation. Definitely all about breaking down those vertical silos, getting horizontal. And really, I think a call to action there was looking at supply chain and saying, you've got to step up, you've got to elevate. And I can tell you, this is a tough time to ask for that because supply chain has already stepped up and elevated during the pandemic and really been stretched to quite an extent. And I know the clinicians have felt the brunt of that too on the receiving end, especially with a lack of supplies and back orders. And one thing that Dan said was, and I think this is so true, that healthcare organizations are really good at being adaptable and flexible. And so in so many ways, that strength got us through the pandemic, but it doesn't necessarily get us through the changes in the reimbursement model. It requires us to be more efficient. And so even as we look at these workforce shortages and ask more out of supply chain, I think the biggest thing is I've heard so many people say that supply chain finally has a seat at the table with the sea level. And so how do we hold it? And it's a conversation like this that helps you hold it because, you know, compensation roles, responsibilities, talent acquisition, that's the kind of transformative change that will start to build trust because if supply chain is going to enter into the operating room, they're going to have to come with, you know, a, not only a new model and a new strategy, but they're going to have to really build a lot of trust. I, I agree. I mean, if somebody came to me as a clinician and said that another department was going to take over ownership of clinical processes, I'd be like, oh, wait, hold up. You know, we can be incredibly territorial and we don't always necessarily like it when somebody says the word change, but change is good and change can benefit us. And I really thought that Dan gave a good example when he broke down really what those vertical versus horizontal really looked like. And because we see that in the operating room with supply chain doing this and sterile processing doing this, and then the ORDers doing something else and all of these different departments being very vertical when we could have these horizontal workflows. And we spend so much time being reactive and dealing with problems after they happen. If there was a, if there was a way to get ahead of that and actually be proactive instead so that we got rid of that reactive, problem and stress, everybody's work day and work life would be so much better. And how much time do you spend, you know, with the whole billing aspects of what's going on in the operating room and dealing with supplies? And honestly, with the workforce shortage and the nursing shortage, it's impacting everybody. But nurses doing supply chain functions is a luxury that we probably don't have anymore. That's another, you know, big concern, I think, when we're looking at how we're staffing out the operating room, because we still have this backlog of procedures and everybody's like, Hey, we're back to pre pandemic volumes. That doesn't matter. You've got a six, seven month backlog. You have to go to more than pre pandemic and you have left staff to do it. So one of the ways to accomplish that is to remove some of those responsibilities that are not directly, you know, clinical and patient care oriented. Right. I completely agree. Take that burden off and let the clin clinical staff focus on the clinical patient care and alleviate that burden that they're also doing multiple things at one time. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of First Case. As a reminder, we'd love it if you downloaded our smartphone app because it's the best way to listen to First Case. We're available on iPhone and Android, but if you'd rather listen to us on Google, Amazon, or Apple Podcasts, certainly you'll find us there, as well as iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, or just search for First Case on your favorite podcast application. We would absolutely love it if you gave us a rating and a review while you're there. And we also enjoy feedback. So if you've got recommendations for guests or topics on the show, season themes, just send an email to info at firstcasemedia.com. And on behalf of Melanie and myself, thanks for listening to this Vendor Spotlight on First Case. Oh,